Welcome to the Free Library of Philadelphia. My name is Jason Freeman, and tonight it is my great pleasure to introduce Kwame Alexander. He is the author of The Crossover, referred to by the New York Times Book Review as a beautifully measured novel. It follows twin brother basketball stars coming to terms with the world. Winner of the 2015 Newberry, Newberry Medal and the 2015 Coretta Scott King Honor Award, it was recently adapted for Disney Plus into a television series. Also a poet, educator, and activist, uh, Alexander is the author of 36 other best-selling books, yes, you heard that right, including Rebound, The Undefeated, and The Door of No Return. He is also a regular contributor to NPR's Morning Edition, co-founder of a health clinic and literacy program in Ghana, and is the founding editor of Versify, a publishing imprint focused on changing the world through words. He joins us tonight with his latest book, Why Fathers Cry at Night, a memoir in love poems, recipes, letters, and remembrances. Both a memoir and collection of love poems, this work brings together the various parts of his past and present relationships to offer a larger narrative of his family's love. A Washington Post review claims that Why Fathers Cry at Night, quote, offers a refreshing masculine vulnerability that is rarely seen. Tonight's author will be in conversation with Tracy Michelle Lewis Jiggets, the author and co-author of 15 books that explore topics such as faith, race, social justice, and motherhood. She is a professor of English and Black Studies at the Community College of Philadelphia and hosts, hosts the podcast Heart Talk with Tracy Michelle. And she is the founder of Heart Space, a healing community for those who have experienced trauma. Her writing has been published in the Washington Post, Essence, the Guardian, and Ebony, among many other publications. In her recent essay collection, Black Joy, Stories of Resistance, Resilience, and Restoration, for which she joined us right here on this stage, uh, she celebrates the reaffirming power of black joy. So let's give a warm Philadelphia welcome to tonight's guest. Good evening. Good evening. How are we? Let Kwame get his waves. <laughs> <laughs> See all my peoples. See y'all. Yeah. Thank you so much for stopping by. Um, I am, I have to say, so excited, Kwame. I am so excited about this book. Um, it, well, I'm not, gonna, I'm not gonna dive into my questions quite yet because the first thing that I want to do is tell you thank you, not for this, but for everything that you've done thus far, for the way that you've poured out to our babies, to our children, your books have not just been about stories, right? They have been life lessons, but not the preachy kind. Um, they're the kind that stick with you. I have a nephew um, who every Christmas I was sending him a Kwame Alexander book. I was sending him the crossover and rebound and everything. And now he's graduating from high school. And those books fueled his love of reading. And I'm so grateful to you. Can we give him a hand just for the work that he's already done? And before we dive into why fathers cry at night and just how impactful I think just on another level this book is, I wonder if you might read for me. Um, and I want to tell you what to read. Is that okay? <laughs> I would expect nothing less. <laughs> uh, just as a sidebar, um, I met Kwame 20 years ago at the Books Expo of America um, when we were both kind of hustling and, and, and getting our books out into the world. Um, and so that, that gratitude that I showed in the beginning, that thankfulness has to do with watching your trajectory and, and watching how you have approached this, this, um, this work of yours with authenticity and humbleness. And I, again, there's just so much gratitude, but I would love for you to read Love Story, if you don't mind. In here, I believe it's the um, part part three instructions for leaving. We're gonna just dive right in. It's called love story. Yes. 
<laughs> yes. <laughs> oh no. <laughs> the whole thing? Just wherever oh. you feel like stopping is fine. If you want to read the whole thing, that's fine also. <laughs> <clears throat> Thank y'all for coming out. One, on the bus ride home from his first concert, they argue like Africans in traffic. <clears throat> he fumes at the way she melted like sub-Saharan shea butter when the old bald guy from work, a painter in his spare time, told her she could borrow his used brown sob until they got back on their feet and then bragged about the time he rode an elevator with Chardet that he was so close he could count the beats of her pulse, then drove straight home and sketched her full body from floor to ceiling. Later in bed, reading Alice Walker by nightlight, his heart is muted, their backs, two gridlocked bumpers parked under quiet stars. He has almost said something 16 times when she rubs his scalp, takes the book out of his hands, reads to him the way she sprinkles jazz in his ear, tempts his familiar, turns him around to the next evening after leftover ramen curled up on the couch watching the baseball game volume down. She comments on how number 13 just grabbed the ball, ran up the middle, and almost hit it out of the park. And he wants to laugh so loud at the wonderful jumble of metaphors, but instead he leaps up like he's catching an alley-oop and then sprints to put the dishes away so they can play. Three, from the kitchen he glimpses her calf, the left one dangling a smooth, satisfying curve, a trumpet blowing his mind. He wants her. The last black pot glistens, its lid a sweet silver flash. He holds the fork like a bedtime ritual, carefully bathes each time. You see, the dishwasher is too loud, plus he gets to listen to jazz. But when he is almost finished, ready to round the bases, he hears the troubled water, a cacophonic wave of salt, and sorrow, she is listening to the news again, something about a boy and skittles and rain and blood and the weight of being black. Before there is ocean, he turns down autumn leaves, hollers, you know it's National Poetry Month, right? <laughs> Maybe tonight I'll pin you a pantoum. She doesn't laugh like she used to, but she does flip the channel. It lands on Jeopardy, the category, math. What is, I want more. I want the whole geometry of you. Connect me with those lines of leg and toe, elbow and neck. The last dish clean, he moves to her, lifts, carries, places, peels off her shiny stockings. This is where I want to be, he thinks. But right before he can divide, Above the unpredictable sound of miles, he hears the complexity of their love. He hears the sweet thunder that is life. I'm leaving. Four, they met in college at a church barbecue. He was reciting a poem about how you should never mix citrus fruits with melons. She was praise dancing, carrying a crab leg like a torch. For a year, all they did was smile each morning at 7.30 in line for breakfast, but this day was different. You're the poet, came a voice from behind his chair. He swallowed because spitting watermelon seeds was not an option. May I sit down, she asked. Shaking his sticky hand, he welcomed her, of course, eyeing her dancer legs. Those calves will be the end of me, he thought. The next weekend, she'd invited him to see Spando Ballet. And when he explained that while he loved to dance, he just wasn't that into ballet, and would she mind if they just caught Footloose? She kissed him on the cheek like the, like the neighbor had done when he showed up to trim her hedges for $7 and then pulled out his mother's kitchen scissors. Before the movie, he made her dinner, rice aroni and baked chicken, but it was the dessert, the blueberry scones, and the listening to Marvin all night long that molded her heart and shaped her love that made her legs rise like two piccolo trumpets. They never made it to the movies. A week later, she moved in with her Bible her retainers, her soft rock albums, and a sweet-smelling orange blossom that she mixed with warm milk and honey for their baths. He was thunderstruck. Five, after he introduced her to Nancy Wilson and Cannonball Adderley, she taught him the secret to a good omelet, chili powder, 
they overslept regularly, skipping classes, reading to each other, planning a future. The way she woke him each day was epic and electric. Six and five years later, it is over. Just like that, she holds his hand to her chest, tells him that she is still a word woman, that first and foremost, she will always love the way he colors her line by line, word by binding word. But metaphors can't pay the mortgage, Kwame. There are no stock options for literary photographers of passion and pain that dentists don't accept concise wordplay as payment that all the beautiful music in the world don't mean a thing if we don't have a vehicle to carry the hopes and dreams in our heart. Seven, the next day, when he watches her drive away in the two-door metallic gift to the sound of a runner stealing home in the ninth inning, he knows the masquerade is over, and so is love. Mm. And so is love. Mm. Yes, absolutely. So beautiful, so layered, so nuanced. We're going to talk craft in a minute because I'm a writer, so I, I can't not talk craft. But I want to just open up with, um, you could have written another poetry collection. You could have written another middle grade book. You could have written another children's book. This book is deeply personal why this book at this time, at this season in your life? So it's a good question. That particular piece, that was just me writing a love poem. And I had written like 20 or 30 love poems. And, and when you're writing love poems, you're writing from the vantage point of yourself and what you've experienced and what you hope to experience. So as I'm writing these love poems, in particular that one, I realized, oh snap, that's about me. No, that's really about me. No, I've literally just gone through my entire first marriage and had no idea, like, I'm just trying to write something interesting that y'all will find engaging as readers. And so my editor says, Kwame, you, you're telling a story in these pieces. Mm -hmm. You should really give some context to this. She ain't used the word memoir, because if she had, she would have scared the <laughs> crap out of me. <laughs> So she says, you should write some prose pieces to give some context to these poems, because you're telling a story. I was like, all right. And then before you knew it, I had written like four or five pieces of prose. I would written, you know, a letter um, to my daughters. Um, I had written, you know, a prose piece about my mother's fried chicken mm -hmm. and me moving to London and trying to remember how she made it. And so teaching myself how to cook her fried chicken as a way to remember her. And then I'm like, okay, I should include a recipe, that recipe in the book. And before you know it, I've got all these sort of elements, these components, mm -hmm. and it's a memoir. And by then it was done. And I hadn't thought about it. I thought about it intellect. Well, I thought about it um, from a business standpoint. Ooh, I'm going to sell a lot of books. <laughs> it's not just a poetry collection. This is a memoir. So I'm thinking of it from a business standpoint. And only, it was not until I read the, the book in February, I got the advanced reading copy, and I read it, and I said, oh, I can't publish this. <laughs> this can't happen. I'm, putting, I'm saying too much. And I, and, and I did not intend to do this. And of course, it's too late then, because the book is already done. <laughs> so there, there was a disconnect between the emotional side, the personal side, and the actual writing? So you were not thinking at the time that you were writing about yourself at the time? Well, I knew I was writing about myself. But in abstract. Well, I was using metaphors. Right. And figurative language. Right. I mean, the ninth inning, and he wants to round the bases. I'm hiding behind the metaphor, yes. which is what I've done in every poem I've ever written, which is what poets do. They hide behind the metaphor. But at a certain point, I began to write these prose pieces that were giving context to the metaphor. And they were, it was cool, I was loving those memories of my childhood and my Uncle Richard and, and, and my mother and, and, and my father teaching me how to play basketball. I'm remembering all this stuff and I'm having a good time. 
but I don't understand really intellectually that I'm giving context to these poems so they're no longer just metaphors. Mm -hmm. Like they're gonna make sense to people. Mm -hmm. Wow. And so that was really scary yeah. once I got to that point, which was three months ago. <laughs> Well, let's, let's talk about your mother. Let's, let's go back to your first love. Uh, you open the book writing about your mother and you speak of her and your relationship with her so beautifully. There's lines like, she called us to dinner like we won something. A nighttime poem became a play, became a production. Our bedrooms were Broadway. And I feel like you are grounding us in your story very early on with like like you said providing context with these these prose pieces why was it important for you or did you even realize it to start there to start with sort of your first love and your mom in on a on august the 26 2017 I was, in, um, I was in Vancouver, Washington. I had just gotten off a Disney cruise with my kid. And, um, and I had gotten a phone call. Like I, hadn't, I had gone on this vacation. I'm not good at going on vacations. I like to work. So I'm on this vacation. I'm not answering the phone. I'm not going to do anything. And so when I get off the ship, I, my phone's got like a bunch of messages. One message is from my mom, happy birthday, Kwame. My birthday was the 21st of August. A, a, the last message is from my father saying, you gotta come home, your mom is not doing well. So I get home, they lived a block away from each other. I get to her house, my father and my sisters are outside, they're arguing. The EMT says, get, you can get in the back of the ambulance, your mom is there. So I get in the back of the ambulance and and she's, she's smiling, she's like, I'm glad you made it, I want you to come to the hospital with me, sit in the room with me, yada yada. So I went, cool. So I get to the hospital, they're running tests. This is five days before my novel Rebound is due to my publisher, and I've missed four deadlines already. And so I gotta turn it in by September 1st. And so each day I'm in the hospital while they're running tests, and I'm working on this book because I'm gonna finish it. And I remember like three days in, she has a stroke. Mm. And my agent's like, you don't have to do anything else with that book, just p deal with, focus on your mother. And I'm like, nah, I gotta finish the book. So I'm, I'm sort of, you know, she loved ice chips. So I'm trying to feed her ice chips and She's not responding, she's not really doing anything. So I'm in the chair, I'm finishing the book. And so the, the, the next day, the book, I'm almost finished the book and, and, and the doctors are like, we can't do anything else for her. Do you wanna take her home? And so I grab her hand, she can't talk, she can't communicate, I grab her hand because I've seen it on TV or you read about it or whatever, like <laughs> squeeze my hand once, right, that whole thing. <laughs> I'm like, squeeze my hand once if you want to go home to die in your bed at this point because the doctors can't do anything. And she squeezes my hand. Yeah. And I'm like, and I feel good in that moment. Like, yeah, like there's, there's some hope. There's some communication. And I say, I got everything covered. If you need to go, you can go. I take her home. I finish the book at about 5.30 and submit it. And at 8.30, she passes away in my sister's arms. And then I go into like planning mode. I'm gonna plan the best funeral. I go into business mode. I'm gonna plan this amazing funeral. I'm gonna be the MC. If there's an MC at a funeral, I don't know, but I'm gonna be that person. So I plan this funeral. And Nikki Giovanni is at the funeral. Like all my people are there, all my mother's family. It's a beautiful thing. And I'm in the pulpit introducing people, the choir. And I remember looking out in that front row and seeing my, my father who was in this, like he wasn't even dressed. Like I didn't think appropriately. I was like, why are you wearing that? This is your wife's funeral. And I'm like, and he just looks broken. I'm looking at my sisters and they just look broken. 
Like they can't, they just, I'm thinking to myself, these people look so pitiful. I got it together. And, and, and all these years later, you know, a few years have passed. And like professionally, I'm doing my thing. The books, the career is going great, but I can't sleep and I'm unhappy. And I remember thinking, dude, you were the pitiful one. Like you never went through this grieving process. Everybody else did but you. <clears throat> and so once I figured out what I was doing in this book, writing about love and how I learned to love and who taught me how to love and how I failed at love and where I want to go with love, like the person who taught me, who, who, who loved me first, mm -hmm. the first, the person who told me every time I talked to her that she loved me, like it was going to always begin with my mother. Yeah that was the, going to always be the beginning of this book, even if I didn't know it. Yeah. And it was gonna end with her as well. Yes. I'm glad you shared that. There's a part in the book where you kind of have this dialogue with yourself and... Uh, <laughs> um, that wasn't even my idea. It wasn't? No, it, it was, like there's so many pieces of this book. It was Chef's Kiss at the end. <laughs> no, it, and the, the person's idea who it was, actually it wasn't her idea. She said, Kwame, you need to write letters to the people in your life about this book. Because I had shared with her that I hadn't, I hadn't given the book to anyone to read in advance. Oh, wow. Like when you write a memoir and there are people in it, sometimes it's considerate to let them read it. I ain't let them read it. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> you know, and part of it was in my defense, I ain't know it was a memoir, y'all. <laughs> Don't judge me. So, so, I, so, I real, so at the point where I realized, oh, snap, I ain't let them read it. And Christine was like, Kwame, you should write them all letters mm. to give them context to what you've written. And so, I don't even remember the question, but yeah, <laughs> so those letters ended up being in the book. Yeah, th this piece though, it feels like a letter to yourself though. It's kind of where you land, I think, not to give the book away that I didn't give it away, but um, you know, you're kind of, when you're talking about the passing of your mother, you know, you talk a book about not crying and not allowing, like detaching enough to, to the point where you're not crying or grieving in that way. Um, and so I just found it um, actually just extremely well done in the sense that after having all of these letters, all of these recipes, the recipes are fabulous, y'all, for real. Um, but um, all of these, po all these pieces, this poetry, you land at this, really uh, powerful conversation with yourself. I wanna, you mentioned your father and sort of this, him showing up and not being dressed the way um, you would have liked him. Um, your father has a thread also in this book and there's a clear, I think, tension. There's, there's like this realization it feels like that you're having that he absolutely loves you, but the love wasn't demonstrated in maybe in the way that you had once longed for. You say um, in one piece, uh, it w he wasn't all blues. I love that language, he wasn't all blues. Um, but there's still like this longing and then there's this resignation that like he is who he is. Talk a to us a little bit more about that tension I know you said that, you know, your dad said he was going to see you, <laughs> you know, like talk to you about that tension, though, and what you learn exploring your relationship with your dad on the page. I mean, over the years in my speeches and, you know, articles and interviews, I've complained about my father or in a way he forced me to read books. <laughs> you know, he made me read his college dissertations, you know, and I always say it in this way. That is, you know, it, it may come across as me complaining, remembering as a child how I felt, mm -hmm. right? And so that is carried over into my adulthood. Um, and, so, and so I talk a lot about that in the book. 
I don't, I don't ever remember him saying, I love you. I knew he loved me, but I don't ever remember him saying it. And so for me, that became a thing. Why you ain't say it? And so I just began to sort of pick at all these sort of things as I'm on this journey to really trying to discover who I am mm -hmm. as a way to be better at being who I am. And, and so I, um, what I've learned after writing this book, he texted me the other day. Well, so he made that statement. He, when he read the memoir, finally, he texted me, or he, called, he, he texted me, and he said, I read your little memoir. <laughs> and then he said, I'm going to sue you for slander. <laughs> and by the way, how you been? <laughs> right? <clears throat> and so <clears throat> he was definitely in his feelings about sort of what I wrote in the book. Um, and, and so it was interesting, but my father doesn't, again, if, you don't, if you're not really emoting, if you're not, like if your only emotion is like anger and you ain't dealing with any other emotions and you're not really sharing how you feel. My dad wasn't that person, unless that feeling was I'm upset, I'm angry, I'm gonna share that. But I never saw it the other side. And so the book came out on May the 23rd. It's now June the what? June the 6th. So I bought my father an iPad during the pandemic. He has become adept at using iMessage <laughs> with every emoji possible. <laughs> <laughs> so I got a text message from him a few days ago, just randomly. And he says, I never heard I love you from my father. Mm. He said, come to think of it, I never heard I love you from my mother or my father. He said, I knew they loved me. He said, because when I was in the Air Force, he called his, his, his mother, mother, that's what he called her. He said, when I was in the Air Force, 2,500 miles away in Ellsworth, my mother would write me once a week. And of course, as a poet, now I'm filling in all the stuff he's not saying, mm -hmm. and that meant everything to me, mm -hmm. right? And he says, my father never wrote a letter. And then he says, but I knew he bought the stamps. Mm. <laughs> he said, and, and then he repeated, like he's a poet or something. My father is not a poet. <laughs> and, he, and he said, I never heard them say I love you. But when I was five years old, I read the newspaper to my father every day. And he sat there and he listened. He said, um, when, he said when you get older and when you, in the by and, when you pass on in the by and by, you'll, you'll get the answers to some of these questions you've been asking. In the meantime, if there's anything you ever want to ask me, just ask me. Wow. You all have no idea how life-changing yeah. that is. Wow. Wow. That's also a testament to those words. Like he had to read those words on the page, read your heart on the page to get to the place where he could say that and give you a little bit of insight that in all your li years of living, he had never shared before. Right. So there's power in the words that he forced you <laughs> to yeah, learn, right? Not, right. That's <laughs> so the there's like this cyclic, cyclical generational thing. Um, it's just, that's fantastic. Um, I'm gonna shift gears again. Um, you have this, these, uh, this beautiful language for your grandmother. Um, again, I pull these quotes like, never having to fight for paradise. Just really beautiful, powerful things. And, and even 
um, the love that you received from your first wife and, and your second wife and the women in your life. But I think what stands out to me, because you thread them throughout, is that you used or experienced food as a kind of a way to show love, right? So you, you have these stories about um, the first meal that you made um, for Nandi, um, Nandi. You, Nandi. Um, and then your grandmother's 7-Up cake, right? Which my great-grandmother made the best 7-Up cake ever. Um, I will challenge you, challenge you on that. But um, the- You the, lose. <laughs> The uh, fake duck, the the fried chicken that you talked about, um, incorporating the recipes in the book, right? Um, why was it important for you to do that? And then the way that you present the recipes is this kind of like um, a step on your way to understanding love, right? So yeah. I can imagine you being in London and cooking these recipes and like remembering and going back and like identifying what the love story is for each one of those meals. Why was it important for you to put that? Because that's different. We don't see that in memoirs a lot, so. Yeah. I mean, my mother's family would have Saturday night parties. They were the party side of the family. It was dominoes, spades. That's right. And, and libations. Yes. And, they, and it was Norfolk, Virginia, Tidewater, so it was a lot of seafood. It was crabs, shrimp salad. And the house was always so festive. Like the food was, like the food was the vehicle to get everyone there to then experience all of the beauty and the woe and the wonder of a village. That's what the, the food was the vehicle. It wasn't the end, it was the means, mm. right? But it was this beautiful fellowship. Sunday was my father's side. They were not partiers. They were very <laughs> religious. And so it was Sunday dinner. And it was my grandmother cooked for 40 people, like 25 grandkids, children, her children, their spouses, neighbors who weren't even supposed to be there. <laughs> she cooked for all these people, and then she somehow was the first person in church. I don't know how she did all this. Mm -hmm. But the thing that she cooked that I loved the most were these yeast dinner rolls. And when we'd pick her up for church, I'd, be, I'd volunteer to go in the house to get her, because then I could see the rolls rising and smell them. Y'all heard? Y'all had that smell before? Mm -hmm. Yo, <laughs> that smell is everything. So I would go to church and I'd be in Sunday school and sitting in the in the congregation, like waiting to get back for those rolls, because you got forty people, so you can imagine how many pans of rolls, and it was only guaranteed that you got one roll. That's it. You were lucky if you got two. I was the oldest son of her only living son. The oldest son of her only living son. Her oldest son had passed away. And so she made me a pan of five rolls <laughs> every Sunday. The shade and the hateration from my cousins <laughs> is legendary. To this day, some of them still don't like me. They still hate me. <laughs> The jealousy, because <laughs> I got five rolls. But it was, it was get out of here, the adults are talking, the, the grown folks are talking, go outside. It was arguing with your cousins. The food was a vehicle to all the sort of benefits of living in this village, in this community. So when I moved to London and, I, and my marriage was sort of falling apart, and we, we landed in London in, in, the, in August of 2019. I told myself, I'm going to teach myself how to cook. 
and I'm going to learn how to cook some of the meals that my mother, my grandmothers made for us as a way to A, remember them, to try to get closer to them, and as a B, to try to create that village. Mm -hmm. And so that was my plan, and it worked. It worked. It worked in a really profound way to the point that when we moved back three years later to America, the marriage was over, but we had realized and agreed that the family was still very much alive, very much still happening. So we have a thing every first Sunday called Jubilee, and I cook for about 20 people. Mm. And again, it's the vehicle for keeping the family and the village together. I love that so much. They just gave me the five minute notice and I'm like upset because I have quick. so much, <laughs> it's gone so fast. Um, so let me just, let me talk. I'll crap. keep my answer short. No, Sorry. no, no, I know, please I talk don't. a lot. <laughs> I love the stories. Um, I want to talk craft a little bit. Um, your poetry, um, including the spicy pieces, there's some spicy ones in here, um, which I really loved. Uh, you rode me until lightning struck us down. That we, got, one we got kids in the audience. I'm sorry. <laughs> Sorry. Slow down. <laughs> um, that one took me out. <laughs> um, but what I, what I want to say is that your poetry harkens back to what I think is a different time. I hear the rhythms of Nikki, who I know was your teacher and your, your literary mother is your literary mother. Um, I hear Lucille. I, I even hear Gwendolyn Brooks. Um, and there are pieces that I feel like are echoes of the poetry of the Black Arts Movement. I'm curious about your writing process. Mm -hmm. Are you writing with the intention of creating that sound or creating that? Are you, you know, are there like whispers of these artists in your mind when you're telling these stories? Um, or are you just kind of like pouring out and then refining later? Yeah, I mean, because of all of T.S. Eliot said, immature writers imitate and mature writers steal. <laughs> like, the way, there's no way I'm sitting on this stage after having written 39 books were it not for my parents. Mm. As much as I complain about my father making me read all these books and dictionaries, there's no way I'd be here without the impact, the influence, the immersion that I had with books from a, from a very early age. When I write poetry, like it comes out of a tradition of the poets that I read in my father's garage. Mm -hmm. Hakeem Adabudi and Sonia Sanchez and Nikki Giovanni and Amiri Baraka. It comes out of the poetry that my mother read to me as a kid and Lucille Clifton. And Nikki Giovanni spin a soft black song and, and my favorite book, uh, Fox and Socks. <laughs> And so when I'm writing books, in particular for young people, like when I'm writing the crossover or when I'm writing, you know, booked and, you know, I'm not consciously thinking, oh, I got to make this poem cool for kids. Mm -hmm. No, I'm trying to, I'm trying to, I am writing from a tradition that has been a part of my life for 54 years. So it's a very organic thing that has come as a result of reading a whole lot. So like in Rebound, the poem I wrote at my mother's, the book I wrote in my mother's um, hospital bedside, I didn't, I didn't have to like think, ooh, I want this poem to, to just really be sort of hip hop or rhyming or really cool for kids. I just knew that um, it was something that had to be um, meaningful and significant to me and really representative of, of everything I've ever learned about poetry. Kick so hot his feet glow, move so cold you see snow, tall as a cypress tree, bro, game so lit make seeds grow, in your face 3D show, game so deep it's be low, air so swift you breathe slow, watch me fly from the free throw, Superman is sweet, yo, but Tracy is my hero. That comes right out of my mother coming in my room every time I got punished. And I got punished a lot because <laughs> I was very precocious and like really kind of, you know, crazy. 
but I would be upset and I'd be in my room and I'd be like, I hate her. She's so mean. And she'd come in my room and she'd do some really cool poem. <laughs> Folks, birthing is hard and dying is mean, so why not get yourself a little loving in between? And then she'd walk out the room. <laughs> and I'd be so mad because I was laughing and I didn't want to be laughing. I was mad. But she knew what she was doing. And so... So when I write, it comes out of my mom, out of my father, out of all these poets I've ever read that have just become a part of my life. And so when young people ask me or when teachers ask me, how do we get kids to want to write? You got to give them stuff that's really interesting to read. Yeah. Yes. I love that. Um, the thread in this book that I notice is your reckoning with grief, whether that is your, the loss of your mother, um, the loss of your partnerships, your marriages, the, um, the estrangement from your daughter. Um, all of these things seem to be you wrestling with. And in, you have a piece called Poet Walks Into a Bookstore um, where you say, how can you ever be free without someone to hold? But then later on in the piece, you kind of wonder if being able to be alone and be at peace and with yourself, and it kind of comes up later on in the book also, um, is the way to have a kind of freedom or have a kind of uh, place where you can really wrestle with whatever griefs, you, whatever griefs you're experiencing. So I guess my, my final question would be, and that was really my attempt to like wrap two or three comments into one, was like, I know as a writer that something breaks open when you're able to give your truth air, when you're able to share your story, even if it's of grief, um, there's like a, a powerful awakening. It happened with me. Um, so I'm wondering if you just might share with us before we go to the audience for questions. Um, now that you're on tour and you're talking about the book, what this has- This ain't even tour. It's like a therapy session, y'all. <laughs> <laughs> I can't wait for this to be over. <laughs> <laughs> what has broken up open for you? Oh. As a result of writing this book, what revelations- um, inform how you're moving forward, especially now that you have to talk, you know, you're talking to people about it. It's real simple, and this is really going to be a short answer. I, this is all real time. Like, some of the things that I've answered tonight, I didn't answer them the same way last week. Mm. That's how fast this is happening. And it's absolutely terrifying and so rewarding. It's incredibly hard and, and profound in terms of, you know, as Christine Platt said to me when she was reading an early draft of it, and she was like, Kwame, you're not grown. You're not a grown man, you're a growing man. But here's what I learned. Vulnerability, which I've never had in the way that I have it now, it leads to authenticity. Authenticity, which I still struggle with, but I'm way better at it. I feel like I'm more authentic. Authenticity leads to healthier relationship to yourself and to other people, especially the people you love and the people who love you. That's what I learned. Mm. I love this for you. You're moving at the pace of healing. And I, I love that for you. So it's kind of a writer question. I have like a lot of stuff in my head that I desperately want to get out into the world. And I keep stopping myself. And I think what I've come to realize is that I'm, I'm kind of afraid, not so much of it not doing well or being received well, but I'm kind of afraid of not being able to do justice to what I have in my head, you know? Like, I, I'm, I'm afraid that as I write this stuff down, I don't have the, the skill to, like, have it land the way I want it to. And I just, how do you, you've written a lot of, a lot. 
how do you get past that kind of like you know that that critic you know that um that oh I see you know well, that's wrong with this and I have to stop and throw it away like how do how do you how do you get past the point of like concern and get like to the point of creation you know wow that's a tough one Tracy what do you think uh, I think there comes a point in time where you have to trust yourself and trust the story. And if you cannot trust yourself in the stories that you're telling, then that's the work that has to happen first. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and that, so there's part of me, the professor in me wants to say, you sit down and you write anyway. And you make a consistent practice of writing and putting it down because you don't need to be thinking at this stage about publishing and who's going to read it or now you need to get it down on the page and you need to write and rewrite. The other part of me is like sometimes there's work you have to do on yourself, before, especially if this, these kinds of stories where we're putting down, you know, intimate details of our personal lives. There may be some work that has to be done first before you get to the place where you can do that. That's what I think. What about you? I agree. <laughs> That's it right there. I don't, I don't know that the formula, I don't know if there's a formula for it. Right. You know, um, I do know that, what type of writing do you do? Right. Having written a memoir, writing a comic and novel just seems like the easiest thing to do in the world now. I know it's not, but a certain part of writing requires you to bear your soul. And so you got to get to that point where you trust yourself enough to do it. It may mean that you're just doing it for yourself. Right. You're not necessarily concerned about writing it for us. Maybe it's just steps. The thing you write for us might be the thing after you write this for you. Hi. Um so as a daughter with a father who <laughs> has a lack of vulnerability, <laughs> what advice would you give to him and I guess to me um, to take the first steps into becoming vulnerable and be able, being able to express feelings other than anger at each other? Mm, wow. Well. Well, I can share with you what has worked for me, you know? And my father said to me recently, he said, yeah, you, you were on fresh air talking about you got questions for me. And I've never, you know, I've never shared stuff. And he was like, you never asked. I was like, Oh, snap, I didn't. <laughs> I've never, because I was too afraid, like dealing with my own fear. But again, it's almost been like, there's, it's a, this is a, he's like a, he's like a waterfall now. He's just like a wave that's just rushing to the shore. It's just so much he's telling me. And last night he sent me this, this long text apologizing for something that, I've never heard him say I'm sorry about anything. And I was so floored and gutted by it, I didn't even respond immediately. I was like, well, is this really happening? I called my <laughs> sister, I was like, you won't believe what happened. And I think a lot of this has to do with me now finding the courage to just face my fear of asking the questions. Because I think at the end of the day, what's your name? Chloe. Chloe, I think at the end of the day, I think our fathers, they don't want us to hurt. They really, I don't care what they say, how they act, what they do, at the end of the day, we are their children and they do not want to see us hurting. You know? And so we, yeah, that, it, that's, I think that's what worked, or that's what's working for me, is that I just took the first step, and now he just won't shut up. <laughs>
<laughs> it's like vulnerable, vulnerable. I mean, it's, <laughs> Chloe, it is crazy. It is so beautiful to see this. It took me writing a whole book t- mm-hmm. for me to get the courage and I guess for him to feel like there's a door that's open and I'm going to walk through it. And my therapist was like, Kwame, he's going to walk through the door. This was like a couple months ago. I was like, he's never going to walk through the door. She's like, he will walk through it. You've opened it. He will. I want to say thank you uh, to both of you for this conversation tonight. I had no idea what to expect because I haven't read the book yet. Um, but the topic, just seeing it like on the website was interesting. I was like, oh, okay, all right, cool. I want to learn more about this. So I just want to share that it never occurred to me how blessed I am to have a dad who's vulnerable, who cries, who says I love you. My dad and I text all day long, and everything ends with 143, which is I love you in text, like paging, you know, if you guys know what pagers are. Oh, really? 143? <laughs> right. I had no idea. Yeah. <laughs> I love it. So that, so I'm very grateful for that. But it also made me wonder, like, oh, what is my brother's relationship like with my my dad, right? Mm. So now I'm definitely going to ask him, uh, because my family calls me the therapist. So I'm always trying to get (laughs) vulnerable and deep with people. I don't do small talk. But anyway, um, my mother and I just went to therapy. So last year we did six months of therapy together, because she had never said I love you. My mom wasn't a hugger, and um, also, I realized that I needed to go to therapy with her because we went to the nail shop together, and we weren't sitting near each other, and I used to live in Korea, and I I lived in Korea for two years, and I came back, and we went to this nail shop, random story, but anyway, the point is that the man who was doing my nails was like, oh, you're her daughter who went to Korea, and I was like, yeah, he said, she's so proud of you, and I just started crying Mm. in the middle of the nail shop because my mom has never said to me that she's proud of me, so it's just, it's interesting to hear you talk about vulnerability and asking certain questions of your parents and being like, yo, like, why, why are we like this, you know, what is, what is, um, how do we get here? And so through therapy, I learned that my mother also didn't hear from her mother that, you know, I love you and things like that. She heard a lot of criticism, but her relationship with her father mirrors my relationship with my father. Wow. So, you know, it's just, you know, generational, like until we decide to do something different, these waterfalls are waiting for us to like just crack them open, right? Yeah. So, yeah I just want to say thank you for sharing. Thank you. No, you're welcome. You know what comes to mind is and Chloe, this is for you too. 20 years from now, my 14 year old, um, Samaya, my 32 year old, Nandi, they might look back on my life and might say, yeah, my dad said, I love you every day. <laughs> but then he was on the road traveling. He was gone. And can you believe he left and we wasn't at this game? and. They might have their own little beef with me, like I, you know? And my hope is that they extend me some grace, which has allowed me to realize I need to extend my father some grace, you know? That he had a whole set of circumstances and life experiences that informed who he became. And he loved me in the way that he loved me. It may not have been in the way that I wanted. And so I've had to extend him a little bit of grace, or a lot of grace. Um, what's in the next chapter for you? What's in the next chapter? (laughs) So I got a couple different ideas. Like, I really want to write more of my story. You know, at a recent event, somebody said, you've written a lot about your mother, your grandmothers, your daughters. What about the men in your life who have inspired or influenced you in some way? Maybe there's a book about them. That's interesting. So I think that there will be some more memoir-esque type stories. You know? I'm a teacher, and we just finished the crossover. And it was so refreshing to see students who otherwise have no interest in reading, like screenshotting pages and like portions of the book, especially the rules. Um, And after hearing your conversation tonight, I was just wondering 
how much of those the like the specific rules in the crossover been inspired or shaped by like lessons and conversations and your relationships in your life oh, that's actually a perfect way to end tonight too um because those basketball rules in the crossover the father gives his sons basketball rules for life if you miss enough of life's free throws you will you will miss if you miss enough of life's free throws, you will pay in the end. Um, when I was three years old, we lived on 112th and Morningside in New York City. I was born in St. Luke's Hospital. And so my, my mother was in graduate school at Columbia and my father was in graduate school at Columbia and so my father would take me to the playground to shoot baskets to shoot free throws my father was a basketball star in high school college in the Air Force yeah. so he would take me to, he would take me to shoot free throws I was three years old <laughs> the ball was bigger than me <laughs> So he tells me this story about how I was shooting the ball and the ball's not going anywhere near the basket. There's no way I'm gonna make it. And the playground supervisor comes over and he's like, I got my wrench, I can lower the goal so your son can make it. And my father says, no, don't lower the goal. No one lowers my son's goal. He doesn't know he can't make it. And so basketball rule number one in the crossover is never let anyone lower your goals. Always shoot for the sun and you will shine. Thank you. Thank you so much.